So we'll uh, resume this session. Uh, right now we have with us Professor Jay Sukhatme from the Indian Institute of Science, and he's going to talk about moist waves and turbulence. So the floor is all yours. You can get started, Professor Sukhatme. Okay, thanks. Um, right, uh, so thanks for calling me here. Uh, it's nice to be part of the conference. And uh, I'm going to speak about uh, waves and turbulence, but I want to specialize to the case where moisture plays a role in the development of these waves and the evolution of a turbulent field. Now, at the outset itself, I'd like to say maybe um, I have, I've listed too much stuff here. I might not be able to get to the turbulent part. Let's see how, how far we get. We'll at least do the large scale waves first, okay? So um, the motivation for this, the practical setting that I have in mind, and I'd like you to keep in mind, is the tropical atmosphere. So in some sense, this talk is a little removed from the talks you've had over the past couple of days, where you're focused more on, uh, let's say, lab experiments of stratified flows and hydrodynamic instability and so on. Here, we'll be looking at tropical systems and trying to see how we can apply some of the ideas we have learned to these kinds of systems, which have some realistic footprint, right? Now, uh, having said this, I won't be going to large scale general circulation modeling experiments. The philosophy in some sense is to use a simplified set of equations to try and understand uh, uh, the dynamics of these waves, in particular, the coupling between moisture and the waves themselves. In fact, the notion that I would like to get across at some point towards the talk is that moisture is essentially an integral part of the system. So you can't really talk about moisture as being a separate or independent variable, just like you characterize these waves by their pressure anomalies or their temperature anomalies, you also have to worry about the coherent moist anomalies that develop with them and propagate with them, right? So uh, let's begin. Uh, this work that I'm going to show you is a collaboration with my former students, Joy and Suhas. And uh, the turbulent part is ongoing work with Professor Neely Halnik, who's at Tel Aviv, and uh, with a postdoc, Joseph Scrotum, who's been doing a lot of work on the stochastic forcing of these equations to try and see the kind of energy cascades uh, one gets in these simplified moist models, right? Now, uh, the outline that I have uh, for this talk is as follows. So I understand that the audience we have is fairly diverse. Some of you are going to be experts in tropical variability and the kind of systems we see in the tropics. So the first part might be fairly trivial for you, but I would like to get us all on somewhat of the same ground. So uh, try to get some nomenclature straight and more specifically, try to get the length and time scales that we are interested in uh, uh, us uh, a clarified, right? So once we have this in hand and we take a look at what are the systems, some examples of systems that we see in the tropics and the famous wave number frequency diagram, which everybody uses to uh, show a succinct representation of the variability in the tropics, we will go to the first uh, sort of backbone or the simplified model that people use, which is in a sense, the dry shallow water system. And the linear form of the system produces waves and we'll try to see the correspondence between these waves and what we see in observations. Now, from here, my job will be to try and convince you that, in fact, what is missing in this dry system is moisture. And uh, how do we uh, show that moisture is, in fact, in, in, in an inherent property of these waves? Well, we can do this in many ways. And the way in which I will try to show you this is by showing you uh, snapshots or by showing you composites of these various systems and uh, to portray how moisture evolves in a coherent manner with these systems. So this should convince us that the systems we are dealing with are indeed convectively coupled systems, right? Once we have this in hand, we can then go on to uh, constructing simplified moist models, which will be essentially extensions of the dry shallow water system. And when we have the system in hand, I will provide you with some details of the system. My aim is to show you a few examples, most prominently that of tropical waves that we can produce with this simple system, which reproduce some of the features that we have seen in observations. And of course, as I said, if time permits, we will also go to the stochastically forced problem to see how turbulence uh, coexists with these waves. Now, the last arrow that I've drawn over here, which points back to tropical variability, is, a, is sort of a dream in the sense that I really can't connect these simple models uh, to reality in a convincing manner as, uh, as such. But the aim or the background that we have in our mind is to go from these simple models to what we actually see in the real world. Right? So let's begin with uh, the first part, which is essentially a very, very brief summary of the kind of variability one sees in the tropical atmosphere. 
Now, uh, if you take a look at the tropics and you analyze any particular field of your choice, let it be temperature or let's say the pressure fluctuations or uh, uh, the outgoing long wave radiation, what you find is that the prominent time periods for systems to develop and persist for ranges from a few hours, things like thunderstorms and so on that develop and dissipate over the time scale of a few hours, to things that actually last for days to weeks, things that go on for even one or two months, right? So more formally, you uh, hear the statement that tropical variability spans a spectrum of time scales from the sub daily to the so called intraseasonal scales. Now, along with this uh, time scale, of course, there's a spatial scale. And the spatial scales that go along with these are things that go from about tens of kilometers all the way to tens of thousands of kilometers, which is a planetary scale. Right now, even with this, I'm actually skipping over a lot of stuff. For example, if you look at uh, the kind of work that is done on the details of the dynamics of clouds, things like cloud microphysics and so on, the processes there are at a much smaller scale and occur at a much a shorter time scale. So we are sort of skipping over those things and saying, even if we just consider the formation of systems and their persistence, we still have a very large range of time and space scales to consider in the tropics. Now, as far as we are concerned, what I would like to keep, uh, uh, what I what I would like you to keep at the back of your mind is that we will be interested in the synoptic scale to the interseasonal scale. What this means is we will be uh, uh, looking at systems or we will be having systems in our mind that develop over a few days and uh, to systems that actually last all the way up to one or two months, which is the interseasonal scale. And the spatial scale that goes along with them will be of the order of a thousand kilometers all the way up to the planetary scale of tens of thousands of kilometers, right? So, as I said, many of these things would be very familiar to a bunch of the audience, but just to get on the same foot, let me list a few of the examples of tropical systems that fall in this range, right? So this uh, is just a subset of the list one can form. This is by no means exhaustive. You can have more systems that come in this range. But what I have listed over here are things which fall in the synoptic uh, in the synoptic category, which are the first guys, the monsoon lows, the depressions, the tropical storms, the cyclones, and so on. Then you come up to the Kelvin waves, which can go from the synoptic to the interseasonal scale. You have the so-called African easterly waves, which, as the name suggests, are seen off the coast of Africa. You have the equatorial Rossby waves, which are closely tied to the quasi-biweekly oscillation, which, as the name suggests, has a period which is quasi-biweekly, about 20 days or so. And you can go up in even larger time scales. You have the Madden Julian or, or, or the Madden Julian oscillation, which is the MJO, which has a time period of about 50 days or so, and a cousin of the MJO, which is the uh, Borea summer interseasonal os oscillation or the BSISO. Now, these are all act, uh, act acronyms that uh, some of you might be familiar with, some of you might not. But what I want to get across from this slide is that there are a bunch of systems that range from the synoptic scale to the interseasonal scale. And the spatial scales that go along with them are of the order of a few thousand kilometers all the way to the planetary scale. Right? And as I said, these are not exhaustive. There are many more that can come in over here. And the other thing to keep in mind is that these systems are not independent of each other. That is, for people who study the Indian summer monsoon, they'll be very well aware that you have monsoon lows and depressions that form that give a significant amount of rain that we see in central India. But you also have the BSISO or the summer oscillation that is going on in the background. You have the quasi-biweekly mode that also plays a role. So these modes or these waves can interact with each other. And in fact, one of the very active areas of work these days is to see the influence of larger time scale modes such as the BSISO on the development of monsoon lows and depressions and so on, right? But having gotten a sense of the names just to get nomenclature in place, how do we represent this in a succinct manner? Right? So what I want to show you in the next slide is probably the most famous picture you will see in tropical meteorology. This is a, uh, this is a wave number frequency diagram, which essentially shows you the amount of energy that is captured uh, by various disturbances in the tropics plotted as a function of uh, time period. So on the y-axis here, you have the time period or the complementary wave number, sorry, the frequency over here. And on the x-axis, you have the zonal wave number. And what is shown is, you uh, uh, are highlighted is the uh, regions where you have a heightened variability or where most of the energy is concentrated. And you can see that some of these are marked out in special boxes and so on, and we'll get to that. 
But the way in which this kind of a plot is created is that it essentially takes a very long amount of data. This is, uh, for example, I think this is the review from Kilaris et al. in 2009, which is a very, very excellent uh, a piece of work that brings together a lot of the knowledge on these convectively coupled uh, modes. So this is data that spans about two decades. This is daily data from the deep tropics of so 15 north to 15 south. And every day you have a snapshot of what's going on in the tropics. This is a snapshot of the brightness temperature. And what is done is you take a latitudinal mean of this to create one longitudinal profile per day. You do this every day. You tack on these one behind the other to generate a two-dimensional field, which has time on one axis and uh, longitude on the other. You take a power spectrum of that. And this is, in a crude sense, what you have plotted over here. Of course, the actual plot has a lot more refinement in it. But basically, you are seeing at what time periods and at what spatial scales is the variability in the tropics, uh, or, or at what time periods and what spatial scales does the variability stand out, right? Now, what I want you to get from this, this is, of course, a very, very busy diagram. The first thing that, uh, that I want you to note from this is that if you go down this axis, that is, if you come towards increasing time periods, you find that the colors become darker. And uh, I'm sorry, the color bar is missing over here, but darker colors mean more power. So in a sense, more energy is contained in things that have longer time periods. So as you go down over here, you get more and more energy. The other thing to note is that much of the energy is contained within the first 10 wave numbers. If you take a look at this, this is the zonal wave, wave, wave number 10, the zonal wave number minus 10. This is where much of the stuff is concentrated, right? So the essence is that you get a larger amount of energy at larger time scales and at longer time periods. In fact, if you look at this window itself, which is marked as the Kelvin waves, which we had encountered in the previous slide, you find that Kelvin waves that have a shorter time period have less energy than the Kelvin waves that have a longer time period. In fact, the mode that sits down here with possibly the largest amount of energy is the MJO. You can see it marked down here, right? And that is completely dark in the kind of color bar we have over here. So it has a lot of energy associated with it as far as tropical variability goes. So that's one thing that I want you to note. The other thing is, of course, these lines that are drawn in the background. What are these lines and where have they come from? So that is going to be our next task. In fact, they come from theoretical dispersion curves that are derived from a simple uh, shallow water system or a linear shallow water system. And we will write down the equations for that system and see where these modes come from. And the thing to note is that some of the variability that you see in the tropics aligns with curves that we have drawn over here. For example, the Kelvin waves, you have curves that go through the Kelvin wave variability. You have curves that go through the Rossby waves. This ER stands for equatorial Rossby waves. So you have dispersion curves that go through the heightened part that, in a sense, then corresponds to Rossby waves. You have things that correspond to inertia gravity waves, which I hadn't listed in the previous slide. These are the westward moving inertia gravity waves. You have the eastward moving inertia gravity waves over here. Right? So many of these waves or modes correspond to the linear dispersion curves one gets from the linear shallow water equation. But conspicuously, there are certain regions which have a lot of power, which actually don't correspond to any of these curves. For example, the MJO. If you take a look at the MJO, even though it's a little squished in down here, it has a large amount of energy associated with it, but there is no theoretical curve that actually goes through this guy, right? So it seems to be something that is not accounted for in at least as far as this simple representation of tropical variability goes, which accounts for the rest of these dispersion curves. In the same way, you see a small blob that hangs out over here. This is, in fact, the blob that stands for your tropical cyclones and depressions. It's quite muted here because this is an year-round average. So as far as the whole year goes, the power associated with these guys is a little small. If you actually construct the same diagram based on a seasonal data, which corresponds to the summer, you'll find that this mode becomes much more prominent. And in fact, you will get it to be uh, accounting for a lot more energy. Right? And But once again, you see that there is no theoretical curve that approaches this, uh, this region over here. Right? So taken together, what we want to take away from this, uh, from this diagram, as far as this talk goes, is that much of the power aligns with lower frequency waves that have a large scale. And some of the heightened variance that we see aligns with theoretical dispersion curves, which are based on the linear shallow water equations, which is what we are going to get to next. But keep in mind that some of the regions that we see, which have a lot of power, don't really correspond to any of these theoretical curves, right? So that's one thing that one, one, uh, that one can keep in mind. Now, 
as I said, the curves came from the shallow water equation. So what exactly are these equations? Now, this is a set of equations that I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with. The way in which they are derived, uh, well, I guess we can derive them in many ways. One is a formal vertical av uh, averaging of the stratified set of equations. The other is to consider the dynamics of a constant density layer of fluid, which is in hydrostatic balance, and it is three-dimensionally incompressible. Once one makes these assumptions, you get a model that involves u and v, which are your horizontal velocity fields, the convention being that u is eastward and v is northward, and h, which is the fluid depth, which is denoted by, uh, which sorry, h denotes the fluid depth over here. And the thing to note is that this is a two-dimensional model in the sense everything is a function of horizontal space, x, y, and time. It can evolve in time. And of course, the shorthand used is that capital D by dt is a nonlinear convection term over here, right? So with these equations, if you specify the Coriolis parameter f, which is, uh, sorry, f, I forgot to mention that over here, these two terms are the, uh, are the Coriolis terms that come into the system of equations because we are on a rotating reference frame. And if you denote the Coriolis parameter by beta y, this is what we call the equatorial beta plane representation, you can uh, linearize the problem and actually analytically derive the solutions that are, um, uh, and you can derive the waves that are solutions to these equations. And this was done most clearly by Matsuno all the way back in 1966, right? And you can actually solve the problem on a sphere also. You don't really need to make the beta plane approximation. You can take the full Coriolis parameter and you can write the equations on a sphere. You can try to solve the linear problem that you get from there, which was done in great detail by Longyear Higgins in a series of, uh, of papers in the 60s. In fact, it's quite interesting that the spherical problem, uh, that the linear spherical problem still uh, receives a fair amount of, uh, of attention. You can take a look at the work by Paldolf, for example, which was a few years ago, which tries to look at some of the details that were missed in earlier solutions and so on. But for our purposes, the f equal to beta y approximation or the equatorial beta plane is quite fine, right? So once we substitute this and we substitute and, and, and we put in the plane wave solution, what is the answer we get? Well, the dispersion curves we get are portrayed in this diagram. So this is essentially an adaptation of Matsuno 1966. And what it tells you is that you have four families of solutions, right? You have one family over here, which are your inertia gravity waves, which could be westward or eastward. You have your mixed wave, which is a mixed Rossby gravity wave, which behaves like a gravity wave or as, as, as it asymptotes towards the right and behaves like a Rossby wave as it asymptotes towards the left. Sometimes it's also called the Yanai wave. Below that, you have the equatorial Rossby waves. And on the right hand side, which is labeled n equal to minus one just for consistency. So this is minus one, zero, one, so on. This is called the Kelvin wave over here. So this is the backbone of what one gets when one does a linear analysis of the equatorial beta plane equations. Right? And if you put these side by side with the spectrum that we had, you see something quite remarkable, right? This is the theory right over here. And this is the theory superimposed upon the observations from the tropics, right? So this was the power that we found in the various modes. And uh, what you note is that you can now I identify some of these as being Kelvin waves, some of these as being equatorial Rossby waves because of the correspondence from here. That is, these are the Rossby waves. So this is what you call the Rossby wave, uh, wave branch. These are the Kelvin waves. So this is what you call the Kelvin wave branch. These are the inertia gravity waves up here. So this is what you call the westward propagating inertia gravity waves, so on. But quite clearly, there's nothing out here. Right? So there's nothing that corresponds to the MJO, or a structure of this kind or a dispersion curve that would extend out in this direction. Similarly, there's nothing over here. Right? If you take a look at this part of the diagram, there's no dispersion curve that comes into the tropical depression window. So again, this emphasizes the fact that the point that we had made earlier, that you have regions in the wave numbers frequency diagram, which are well accounted for by this dry shallow water system, this dry linear shallow water system, when it's, which in itself is remarkable because it's such a straightforward model, but still you're able to align yourself with actual observations of the tropics. Right? So now at this point, you might say, well, what's the need for going ahead with even more uh, sophisticated models or trying to improvise upon what you have got? You seem to have pretty much captured most of the variability that's going on. All you need is to somehow extend your model to be able to capture these other modes of variability that don't crop up in the dry system. That's a fair point. That can be uh, so. That is one of the goals that people actually have in their mind. In fact, many of these uh, simplified moist 
uh, systems that people develop are intended to try and explain the basic physics behind the NGO. But there's another point that is sort of hidden in the diagram over here is that how did we actually fix the slope of this line? You see here on the right uh, on the right panel, if you can follow my mouse, there are many straight lines drawn for possible Kelvin wave dispersion relationships, which all depend upon what you choose as being the speed of your Kelvin wave. How do you determine the speed of a Kelvin wave? Well, if you come back to, uh, oh, well, I guess this is just what I said. So you, uh, this allows for an identification of what's going on, but what is hidden is the speed of the Kelvin wave or the equivalent depth, right? So what I want to get at is, if you actually uh, take a naive approximation that the entire troposphere is being represented by the shallow water set of equations, then the depth of the troposphere is what will appear in the wave speed of Kelvin wave. And that's a remarkably large number. If you try to compute a root of GH, where H is the depth of the troposphere, you'll get a phenomenally large number, which is much, much faster than the observed Kelvin wave speeds. In fact, this was recognized quite a long time ago. So what people said is that it's not really appropriate to use H as the depth of the troposphere. What you should really be doing is you can take the stratified set of equations, which were discussed in detail, say, for example, in Professor Linden's course. And what you can do is you can do a modal decomposition of those nonlinear equations. That is, you substitute modes in them which have differing vertical profiles. And the first baroclinic mode or the first reversing mode that you have in the troposphere, that that is essentially what obeys the shallow water equations. And the interpretation is that the depth becomes the temperature because that is what one is expanding in terms of these modes. And this was probably laid out most clearly in the very, very influential paper by Gill in 1980. Right? The thing that happens because of that is that the mean depth in a sense becomes an equivalent depth. In the sense, it becomes a separation constant in your problem of separation of variables. So the question is how you determine what this HE or equivalent depth is. Now, there have been many theories in trying to justify or trying to deduce what this equivalent depth should be. The most common approaches are things like a peak projection response, which basically say that if you take an, uh, an observation of, of the tropics, and look at the profile of the heating. That should give you an estimation of where the peak heating occurs. If you take that as the length scale of your peak projection response, then you can derive what the equivalent depth should be. In fact, the, the equivalent depth turns out to be scaled by the stratification and, and the gravity and so on. And it turns out that if you use approximately seven kilometers as the mid troposphere where the heating maximizes, you get an equivalent depth of about a few. Still too large. If you take 200 meters over here, you'll find that the Kelvin wave speed is of the order of 50 meters per second, which is again much faster than what is observed in this slide over here. These speeds are more like 20 meters per second or 12 to, uh, I would say, uh, say 15 to 20 meters per second. So they're much slower than what would come about from this dry peak projection response kind of theory. So what is uh, what the current thinking is that the slowness of these waves that one sees is essentially due to the coupling of these waves with moisture. And the moisture is what leads to the reduction in a speed of propagation of all the waves that we see, including the Kelvin waves. Now, of course, one can say this, but how do I convince you that moisture is actually present and evolves in a cohesive manner with these modes? So that's going to be my second task now. So this sort of brings us to the end of the first half, where we have come up to speed with the nomenclature for the tropical modes. We have come up to speed with what is actually seen in uh, to first order in the tropics. And we have seen what a very basic model can do. Now, we want to emphasize the fact that these, uh, that these, uh, these, uh, these systems can't probably be explained by a dry uh, by a dry theory because you have moist anomalies that evolve in a coherent manner with these modes. To do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially go to this diagram over here. And the trick that people employ is if you see the polygon that is drawn over here that sort of encapsulates this, the Kelvin waves, what you can do is you can shut out all the quick the co coefficients outside this polygon that is set them to zero and reconstruct the fields with only the coefficients of the Kelvin mode present. So that would be a reconstruction of the Kelvin wave. You can do that for all the dynamical variables you have, including let's say your pressure field, your velocity field, your outgoing long wave radiation, which is a measure of the moisture, so on and so forth, right? 
So in that way, one can isolate the moist anomaly and the other dynamical variables that characterize a particular wave. So let's go ahead and try to do that. So the first example that I'm going to show you to establish convective coupling is to show you the example of a Kelvin wave. Right? So here is a diagram from a paper by Wheeler et al. back about 10 years ago. And what they're doing is exactly what I mentioned, of course, in a more sophisticated manner. And they are, I, they are uh, zooming in on the Kelvin wave, which is a wave that exists and goes in the eastward direction on the equator over here. So it's moving in the eastward direction. This is a composite on day minus three. This is a composite on day one. Clearly, you can see that the pressure anomalies, which are shown in dots over here, and the positive pressure anomalies are shown in solid contours. They are not very clear on day minus three. They become very clear on day zero, oh, sorry, on day one. So you have your, cross, uh, your positive pressure anomalies, negative pressure anomalies. And of course, you have your flow, which is denoted by arrows. As the system sits on the equator, near the equator, you have cross isobaric flow because the geostrophic constraint is not strong. As you move off the equator, you get geostrophically balanced flows. But more importantly, what is shown here, in addition to the pressure and the velocity, is the outgoing long wave radiation, which is nothing but a measure of the amount of moisture that is present in the system. So a dark anomaly over here tells you that there is an excess of moisture. So what this is telling you is that along with this Kelvin wave, the characterization in terms of pressure and velocity, you have a large scale moist anomaly that propagates with the system. Note that this moist anomaly has come along with the system over here. In the same way, the hatched a region which is not particularly clear over here is actually a negative moisture anomaly suggesting excessive dryness that has also moved along with the system over here so this anomaly that sits with the pressure signal actually is part and parcel of the Kelvin wave and is evolving with the Kelvin wave. So if one is to characterize this system, not only do you need to use your uh, traditional variables like your pressure and velocity, you should be able to characterize the moisture variable too. That is part or rather an integral part of this uh, of this Kelvin wave over here. Now you can do the same thing for let's say the equatorial Rossby wave. So, ra uh, so rather than filtering the part that comes up in the Kelvin waves, you do exactly the same thing, but filter for the Rossby, uh, the Rossby wave window. And what you find are off equatorial gyres. The fourth gyre is not very clear over here, but you see rotational gyres, which are essentially in geostrophic balance. At the same time, again, the shading represents the OLR anomaly. So you have a lot of moisture that sits Along with this, it's a coherent large scale moisture anomaly. The hatching gives you the negative signed anomaly. And if you actually plot this on successive days, you will see the Rossby wave actually moves in a westward direction. And these anomalies are part and parcel of the system and they will move along with the system over here. So this is again by the same, uh, by the same paper of Wheeler et al in 2009. And the rotational gyres that we see with the Rossby wave are clearly picked up in this and associated with these rotational gyres are these outgoing long wave radiation anomalies. Now you can do this again. This is for another Rossby wave, which is uh, picked up during the Southern Hemisphere summer. So you see that the moisture anomaly is essentially confined to the Southern Hemisphere. You see a negative anomaly back here, which is hatched. That's not very clear, but the positive anomaly sits right here. The four gyres are much clearer in this representation over here. And another thing which I forgot to mention about the Kelvin wave is you can estimate the scale of this guy. Right? Look, this guy is huge. If you draw the wave, this is going all the way over here, which is almost half the planetary scale. So one wave spans almost half the entire globe over here. So this is truly a very large scale wave that you're seeing uh, as uh, in the form of a Kelvin wave over here. The same thing is true for the equatorial Rossby wave. If you take a look at the size of this guy, it's not uh, as big as the Kelvin wave, this particular example. But if you draw a wave down here with the negative and the and the pause also to go here, you get something that has a scale that's of the order of a few thousand kilometers, right? Now, the last thing, yeah. Uh, could we take a question? There is one in the chat box. Oh, sure, sure, go ahead. I can't yeah. see the chat box here. Yeah, so okay. this is from Professor Verma. Uh, uh, why yeah. does low, low wave number modes have large energy? Ah, so that's what we'll come to. Uh, we'll have to wait for a little bit for the answer to that. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's actually going to be an intrinsic part of the adjustment problem that we do is that why does energy concentrate towards these large, uh, uh, these large scales and low frequencies? Okay. Yeah. Hello. 
So uh, okay, so for, uh, so I'll I'll sort of end this part over here by showing you one final uh, uh, example, which is of the African easterly wave. And the only only reason I show this is that this is a wave that has has received a fair amount of attention because these waves are born off the coast, or or, or rather are born on the African continent. They move off towards over the Atlantic Ocean, and many a time they develop into the cyclones and the hurricanes that go on to influence the Caribbean islands and the eastern seaboard of the United States. So to try and see the genesis of those Earth, uh, of those kinds of cyclones, people have tracked things back to these kinds of African easterly waves, which are convectively coupled systems. So how do they actually transform from this wave-like character to a tropical cyclone? That's an outstanding problem that a lot of people have spent a lot of time on. I'm definitely nowhere near an expert on, uh, on, on, on that subject. But the reason that I want to show it to you over here is once again, one can note that you have these large scale gyres, which are essentially in geostrophic balance. In the middle, you have your OLR anomaly or the outgoing long wave radiation anomaly that tells you that there is an excess amount of moisture that's squeezed in between these guys. And the backside, which is the lighter shading over here, tells you that there is an excessively dry patch that's behind it. And if you evolve these ahead in time, you go from day zero to day two, you find that the entire system has moved towards the west. That's why these are called easterly waves. They come from the east. So it's moved off of the coast over here and the anomalies have moved with them, right? So the question is now, if we bring all of this stuff together with this relatively whirlwind tool, the snapshot of tropical variability and moisture coupling that I've tried to show you is that all of the waves that we have identified and all the disturbances that we see do go hand in hand with coherent moist anomalies. So hopefully one is convinced of the fact that there is going to be a dynamical coupling between the uh, phase changes that water vapor experiences, the kind of condensation you experience and the energy that comes into this, uh, that comes into the system of equations. So this coupling is what leads to these waves being called convectively coupled equatorial waves or CCEWs. This is the short form you'd see in literature. Now I have to warn you, uh, CCEWs usually refers to only the waves that correspond to the dry shallow water theory. Usually MJO and tropical depressions are not called convective coupled waves because they don't correspond to any wave modes that we know of, right? So I should probably say these are just convectively coupled disturbances rather, rather than same waves, right? So with so this, this yeah. one, one more question in the chat box from Mukesh. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Asking that can the discrepancy between observed and theoretical Kelvin wave speed be addressed by Doppler or non-Doppler effects of the mean flow? Uh, sure. So that is an attempt that people made to see what is a uh, what is the systematic mean flow that exists in uh, in the tropics. And it turns out that near the equator, if you take a look at uh, so, for example, let me go to this slide. Right. This is the so this is a slide that's made in the lower troposphere, so somewhere around 850 millibars or so. So if you take a look at the mean wind over here, it's not particularly strong. And moreover, the mean wind itself doesn't have a consistent profile if you move, let's say, from the Pacific to the Atlantic region and so on. So even though people have tried to explain certain changes in the uh, uh, in the dispersion curve by adding in a uh, uh, a Doppler shift, you can't really get at a universal answer that oh uh, you know the faster speed uh, or the slower phase speed we see is uh, can be attributed to purely a Doppler shift, right? But you're right, people have tried out trying to see what a Doppler shift can do. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Oh. So, okay, so where will we? Okay, yeah, so we were over here. So this, uh, what I want to sort of end this part with is this uh, uh, sentence I've taken from the review by Kiladis. I hope that this sentence now makes sense to most of us. That is tropical rainfall is organized over a wide range of spatial and temporal scales, all the way from things that are known as mesosale convective uh, 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 complexes, which are of a fairly small scale, all the way up to the planetary scale, such as the MGO. And at intermediate scales, Rainfall or moisture is frequently organized by waves that move eastward or westward, right? So that's exactly what we tried to show examples of with the Kelvin wave and the Rossby wave, right? Now, with this in hand, one thing that we have to keep in mind is all of the waves that we identified and what were seen in the wave number frequency diagram were all of a large scale. So this comes back to Mahinder's question, is that why do we see large scale waves over here? Now, the, uh, the answer in some sense is that that's not all that we see. 
we actually see more stuff. So for example, what is going on at smaller scales? Say for example, I said we are interested in the synoptic scale, so upwards of 1000 kilometers, right? So what's going on between let's say 1000 kilometers and about three, four thousand, a thousand kilometers where these waves start to show a clear signature? Well, that's where you have turbulence. Right? And hopefully, if I have the time, I will show you how these simple models can get the coexistence of a turbulent flow with the waves. And of course, as, uh, as Mahindra Valma has probably already realized, the turbulence is going to feed these waves in some sense. Right? That's, the, that's the thing that we would like to portray with this. So uh, with this in mind, the questions that I want to address with my simple model or the reason why I want to construct my simple model is, can we understand these large scale waves and their moisture anomalies together or in a cohesive manner, right? Now, the other thing of course is, does moisture only, now only is written in italics because this is not a trivial thing, that would also be a very nice thing to understand, is, does moisture only alter the properties of dry waves or do we get qualitatively different modes of variability in a moist system that would not exist or do not exist in a dry shallow water system, right? If you make it moist, do you get new things that go on? And related to this is, are there new, new avenues of tapping energy in the sense, are there new mechanisms or instability mechanisms that can be present in these systems which are not present in the dry, uh, in, uh, in the dry atmosphere? And of course, this whole thing, we are hopefully going to try and capture this or the aim that people have had over the past decade, and probably even more, is to try and capture these in simplified models over here. And the way in which we will do this is going to be by studying initial value problems or the adjustment of random initial conditions to see what kind of systems they produce, whether they do actually produce these large scale modes and whether those modes have anything in common with what we have just looked at in observations. And then if we, of course, if we have the time, we will do the stochastically forced version of the problem and see where energy flows. Does it flow in a systematic direction? How does moisture influence the energy flow that we see in a dry system? Things of this kind, right? Now, before I go to my simple models, I'd like to reiterate that the reason why we are looking at simple models is possibly to allow for a clearer understanding of the coupling between moisture and the dynamics of the problem. As we have said, this is uh, a, a part and parcel of these waves. And you can do this in comprehensive general circulation models. In fact, there have been very, very uh, um, deep studies that have seen the kind of variability uh, that is expressed in general circulation models in the tropics in terms of convectively coupled waves. Now, it turns out that as with most of uh, the detailed studies of GCMs, there are issues with the representation of, uh, of convectively coupled equatorial waves also. But it's very difficult to find out why there is a deficiency. Say, for example, the Rossby waves might be too strong or the Kelvin waves might be too weak. Why does that happen? This is something that's difficult to diagnose in a GCM, in the, uh, es essentially because they're too complicated. Right? This is also paraphrased from the, uh, from the review of Kilardis et al. over here. So what we are trying to do is to see if we can actually represent things in a simpler manner where we could maybe appeal to basics like conservation laws to try and understand what we are seeing. But right? if we could do that, I think that would be very nice. Now, uh, before I move to the moist uh, linear uh, shallow water system and then the moist nonlinear system, I'd like to mention that if you keep the aside, keep aside the issue of the of the uh, equivalent depth, that is the issue of how you describe what HE is. The dry shallow water equations have been extremely useful in understanding tropical variability. By no means should one think that these are things that have been pushed aside. They have given us a lot of insight into the kind of waves that are seen in the tropics. In fact, there have been many, many extensions of these simple single mode, uh, uh, these single mode systems to higher biotinic modes and try to see what kind of waves these multiple higher biotinic mode systems generate, how those waves in, uh, in, interact with each other and so on and so forth. But in all of these, the heating or the right hand side is a prescribed function. Right? So uh, don't discount them, but at the same time, what we want to do is to sort of realize the fact that moisture is an integral part of the system. And we quote from Gill himself, which he wrote in a paper in 1982, is that prescribed heating models are fine, but they're somewhat unsatisfactory in the sense that the heating rate in reality is not independent of the field of motion because the heating is coming from moist convection. And of course, moist convection takes place by moving around moisture, which is moved around by the field of motion. So the two are coupled, right? So now, 
Here is what Gill did in his 1982 paper. He said, well, I'm going to write down my shallow water system as the first baroclinic mode expansion of my stratified system. So you have your equations for U and V, which we had written earlier. And instead of the height equation, you basically get an equation for the temperature perturbation, which looks very much like the height equation. In fact, it has the same form. And what you realize is on the right-hand side, you have a heating term over here. Now, if you were interested in the dry problem or you were interested in the problem where heating is prescribed, you would not worry about the last equation over here, you would prescribe Q and you would solve the problem. You would say, I give you a heating, tell me what the response of the temperature and the velocity fields is. And that has essentially been what people have been doing and have done to great, uh, uh, to a great or a large extent. Right? What Gill did in 82 is he said, well, the heating comes from moisture or from processes like evaporation and condensation or precipitation. So let's add on a variable, which is essentially moisture that's being transported by the flow. So you have moisture that's being transported by the flow, which is another cons uh, cons conservation law in linear form over here. And that's subjected to possibly evaporation, precipitation, and processes of this kind. The question now is one has to close Q and the evaporation and precipitation, which is basically your parameterization. That is, you prescribe Q as a function of E minus P. Once you have done that, you have moisture as a prognostic variable in the system. You let moisture evolve, and wherever you meet the conditions of this parameterization, you either evaporate or precipitate. That's going to give you the heating. That's going to drive the heat. Uh, the, uh, the temperature term that in turn is going to drive the velocity field and you have a consistent set of equations which have moisture as a dynamic variable right so this is the analysis that Gill did in 1982 with the linear uh, moist uh, problem we won't spend much time on it i'd rather go to the non-linear moist problem of the north here which owes its existence to a very, very nice paper which was published in 2009. I'm probably going to pronounce the name wrong, but this is Boshu et al. And this is the French group that came up with this set of nonlinear shallow water equations, which realized that rather than trying to look at a baroclinic expansion of the stratified problem, let's go back to looking at the lower troposphere as a whole and look at condensation and evaporation as processes of loss or gain of mass from a system. And they were able to essentially formulate a shallow water system system where one could treat uh, condensation and evaporation in a nonlinear manner or rather along with the nonlinear equations of motion. And to make things clear, what uh, the resultant thing that you get is the horizontal equations, which have the same form as we had listed below. And what you have is, again, the temperature is now replaced by the amount of substance or the height of the fluid column. It's being advected around. You can relax it to a particular mean depth. And now this chi is like a, it mimics a latent heat in some sense. So this is the function. Uh, so, so this is going to be multiplied by your function that gives you precipitation and evaporation. And of course, the moisture, that's the full conservation law that's being carried around with the system is subjected to evaporation and precipitation. Now here, with these four equations, that is Q, H for U and W, you essentially have a closed system of equations as long as you prescribe what evaporation and precipitation is. That's your choice. You, there are many, many ways in which one can prescribe when evaporation takes place or when precipitation takes place. Or if you don't want evaporation, you only want precipitation, you could do that too. There are various things that people have tried depending upon what their goal is. Right? The form that I will use is probably the simplest form, which is essentially a what is known as a pet Miller parameterization, which says that you take a background saturation field, and if your moisture content at a particular location exceeds the background prescribed saturation profile, you condense. So this is a step function theta over here. It's zero if you are less than zero over here, one if it's greater than one. So this precipitates or condenses when Q exceeds QS. It evaporates when you have the possibility of a given region being subsaturated. Right? You could turn ev uh, e evaporation off if you are just, in uh, just interested in the uh, fate of a precipitating system. But we keep these together so that we can actually study statistical equilibria where moisture is uh, 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 thrown out of the system and is also filled back into this uh, is filled back into the system system. Right? So this is the prescription that we use. You can can use other forms, say, for example, evaporation could be the bulk evaporation formula, which is proportional to the horizontal winds and the moisture deficiency. People have used those kind of things also. Just depending on what application you have in mind, you can choose the kind of protocol that you are interested in. Right? So once we have this, well, a nice thing about this is you can actually derive the equivalent depth. And the way to do it is actually quite straightforward. That is, if you say that the relaxation here is infinitely fast, 
you can actually substitute for the evaporation and precipitation from the right hand side over here and you immediately find that the equivalent depth just becomes nothing but the actual depth minus the latent heat times uh, the maximum of the saturation profile right so this is a simple result to show you can try it out for yourself and this way you can actually choose the latent heating and the maximum to fix the kelvin wave speed as per observations uh, am i running out of time uh, no you have another 15 minutes uh, okay sure there is yeah. one there's one question in the chat box uh, sure. okesh is asking is the linear coupling of enp in h equation only for the sake of simplicity uh, one second let me go back to this uh, so this thing over here yeah right so this is essentially just oh what happened over here oh uh, can you see my slides yeah we can see your slides. okay good uh, so this is just saying that you have the difference between precipitation and evaporation right that's what gives you the total amount that's either lost or gained by the system so if say for example this was the latent heating this would tell you that latent heating times the amount of water vapor that's lost or gained is going to be equal to what you need to bring into the temperature equation times the specific heat right is that okay yeah okay right so now uh, uh, the uh, the final choice that uh, uh, that you have to make is uh, you have to finalize what time scales that you're going to use for your uh, for the evaporation and the condensation now as per observations usually the condensation time scale is smaller uh, than the advective time scale so if you choose the advective time scale to be uh, to be comparable to the order of a few days because we're interested in synoptic scale systems then you say that well you can try out your tau c and tau v to be much less than one in fact we have done experiments where you vary this over an order of magnitude it really doesn't matter as long as you have a separation between tau c tau e the two of them should be far from the advective time scale and you're quite safe in fact there are interesting things that occur when tau c and tau e are comparable to the advective time scale you can actually derive a quasi geostrophic version of the moist model when this happens but that's um, that's a different issue so with this what is the application that I want to show you? Well, the first application that I want to show you is the actual production of moist waves in the simplified model. And of course, as I said, if time permits, we'll go to the turbulent part also, right? So here is uh, a, a, the setting that we have. That is, we have to choose what our saturation profile is going to be. The first choice, of course, is a choice where you say, well, let the saturation profile be a constant. But that would be a bit odd because in the equatorial region, what you notice is that the amount of water vapor you have in the atmosphere is a fairly strong function of latitude. It's also a function of longitude. In fact, the map that's shown here shows you the amount of precipitable water on average that's seen in the tropical region. So what you see is things decay with latitude quite clearly. You also have a sort of a bump over here, a very large Gaussian-like bump that's centered around the Western Pacific. You have another bump that's centered around Central, um, uh, uh, around Central um, 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 America over here. So quite clearly, the amount of water vapor that can be held in the atmosphere is a function of both latitude and longitude. And this issue was in fact raised in a very, very nice paper by Sobel et al. in 2001. That's a remarkable paper that was the first thing or the first paper to really uh, put in the influence of moisture gradients into simplified models. And they found some really remarkable results because of that inclusion. So what we'll do over here is we'll choose QS to be two simple approximations. The first is we will choose it to be purely a function of latitude. And the second is we'll try to mimic this Gaussian bump over here, this bump in a Gaussian uh, manner over here, to say that we have both a latitudinal and a longitudinal dependence, right? And the reason why you can take your saturation profile to be a function of the precipitation of the water is that there are observational is that there is observational evidence that the amount of condensation you get actually is a, is directly proportional to the amount of precipitable water that one has so a reference is given over here there are many other works that show similar things so it's quite okay to take q to be um, a function that is directly related to the amount of precipitable water that's there in the atmosphere right <clears throat> So here is the problem we have. We are going to do an initial value problem. The model has been specified. It's a nonlinear moist model with uh, a condensation and evaporation within those simple form of a Betz-Miller condensation and exactly its counterpart for evaporation. The first case is going to be a case where the background saturation is purely a function of Y. The second case is one where we are going to have QS as a function of X and Y. In fact, that's going to be a Gaussian large scale uh, moisture field or background moisture field, right? So let's look at the 
the first guy. This is what the dispersion relation, the first, uh, the first system produces after you let things settle down for a while. What you see is you get a westward propagating response and you get an eastward propagating response. In fact, the equivalent depth here exactly matches with the theoretical estimate of the rapid condensation limit. In fact, the westward propagating guy over here is a Rossby wave. The eastward propagating guy over here is a Kelvin wave. And now, ra rather than looking at it in wave number frequency space, let's do the same trick. That is, we are going to take this part of the wave number frequency diagram and inverse transform it to see what the field corresponding to it looks like. And this is what you see. So the left panel, unfortunately, for some reason, I've got my contours and colors flipped in the two, uh, in, in the two panels. So let's just look at the first, uh, the first panel over here. First panel, the color shows you the pressure anomalies that go along with the Kelvin wave. So you see your plus and your minus, which is exactly what you see for a Kelvin wave. And the contours actually show you the moisture anomaly where the solid contours are positive moisture anomalies and the negative contours are the moisture depletion. So you see quite clearly, just like we saw in the observations, you have large scale uh, Kelvin waves that are formed, which have a plus and a minus. If you let these evolve in time, they move in an eastward direction, which is clearly seen from this wave number frequency diagram over here. And the pressure anomaly moves along with this guy. You can actually see that the pressure anomaly is all the, sorry, not the pressure, the moisture anomaly moves along with this guy. And the moisture anomaly is of a large scale and is coherent in structure. You do the same thing. And now, instead of extracting the Kelvin wave in the right panel, I've extracted the Rossby wave. That is, if I go back to the previous diagram, I extract this part of the wave number frequency diagram, and I plot the fields that result from that filtering. You see, you have your gyres, which are your rotational gyres, which are a representation of your Rossby wave. These are moving in a westward direction. And now, uh, as I said, I've got the contours flipped. So the contours are actually the pressure anomalies and the uh, colors are the moist uh, are the moist anomalies. So you have moisture, high moisture that's squeezed in on one side. On the tail, you have low moisture that's squeezed in over here. The color bar doesn't show this that clearly, but these are blues over here and here, and these are the reds. And again, if you wait for this to go ahead in time, the anomalies that you see in the moisture fields propagate with the systems. And the equivalent depths that you get clearly matches with the equivalent depth that you would get from the reduced or the rapid condensation limit. right? So you can actually do this. And one thing to note, so this is the thing that goes back to Mahindra Valma's question. The initial con condition here, as I mentioned, is completely random. There was no order imposed on the initial condition. It was basically just uh, uncorrelated noise. And what you see is that if you wait for some time, all the noise is gone. What you correlate towards are the large scale low frequency modes. So in some way, the energy is transferred towards these large scale low frequency modes. The smaller scale stuff gets wiped out and what remains behind is the large scale stuff, right? So that's what you're seeing over here. And you can do this for, uh, sorry, one second, where, where was right? So this is where the large scale modes in the Rossby side, there's the westward side and the Kelvin side, the eastward side are, uh, are remain behind, right? Now, one of the things to note is the other reason why Q as a function of Y or rather the saturation profile as a function of Y makes a lot of difference is that now you have the possibility of a rotational uh, condensation. And what I mean by that is something that you can see by looking at the Rossby wave. What's going on over here is if you take this to be uh, an incompressible system at leading order because this is in geostrophic balance, you don't really have much convergence and divergence going along with it. But what's happening is QS is a function of Y as shown by the contours back here, these light contours. So as you move poleward, you're actually moving from a region that can hold more water vapor to a region that can hold less water vapor. So a saturated parcel just by moving poleward is gonna experience condensation, even if there is no convergence or divergence going on, right? So that's one of the reasons why a, uh, a saturation field that has a spatial dependence can give you condensation both by the rotational advection, as well as the convergence that takes place in the flow itself, right? So these are two things that can give you the process of, or, or rather can result in condensation in these flows over here. Now you can do the same experiment instead of a random initial condition, you can take a Gaussian anomaly that gives you a much more textbook like Rossby wave where the, I, I guess the, uh, the anomaly was somewhere over here. The signal keeps 
prop creating to the west. I've just shown you the Rossby wave part of it. Once again, you get the Rossby waves that sit symmetrically across the equator, and they are much more like the textbook examples that were seen in the Matsuno solution because you started off with a much more ordered initial condition over there. Now, this is all when Q was a function purely of Y, right? The interesting thing is Q can also be a function of longitude. How about we try that out? And here is what you get. So all I have done is the contours here show the uh, background saturation profile. So I'm trying to mimic that big Gaussian bump that you have over here. I've let my initial con condition go over here, which was a coherent moisture anomaly or a coherent uh, perturbation that was sitting on the west of the center of this bump. And what I see after a long time is a set of waves that are actually moving out towards the extra tropics and coming back to the tropics. And you have this strong signal that's actually sitting in the tropics itself. If you decompose this, what you find is this guy is nothing but your Rossby wave, which is actually moving westward. And these guys are actually a new category of waves, which are rotational, but are moving in the eastward direction. They are moving in this arc-like manner over here. So the question is, how do I see this more clearly? Well, once again, I do the same trick of filtering things that are in the eastward direction because the Rossby waves are our old friends, which we saw for QS as a function of Y. So let's forget about them for the time being. Let's try to understand what these arcing out waves are that are going out and coming back, right? So if you do the filtering and you look at these from a short time when the system is let go to a longer time, initially what you see are Kelvin waves. See the plus and the minus. These Kelvin waves tend to fade out over time. You can see that they've become weaker, their amplitudes are weaker. And as they start fading out, you start seeing this rotational response that's eastward that comes out. And this rotational response actually goes poleward, then curves backward. Now, what is happening over here? Where have these waves come from and why are they propagating in this particular manner? And here is where I think these simplified models help because what is drawn in the background over here, apart from the quivers, are contours of the moist potential vorticity, right? So now you realize that if you take a look at these equations and you write down the equations of motion and write down the equation for the moist potential vorticity, which has a form omega by H minus chi Q, the dry PV is just omega A by H. So here you have the extra chi Q term downstairs. This is materially conserved by the system. You can use this material conservation law to deduce the propagation of these rotational waves. In fact, the sense of propagation is always westward with respect to the gradient of the potential vorticity. So if the system was dry, we know that Rossby waves propagate westward with respect to the with, uh, to respect to the potential vorticity gradient. So the situation would be like what is shown over here. Your PV gradient would be in this direction. There would be no moisture, so your PV would just be a function of the ambient planetary rotation. Your systems move in a westward direction. But now, because of the Gaussian form of your moisture anomaly, if you go to a location two your moist PV gradient actually points this way. So the waves that it supports actually go in this direction, which is westward with respect to the arrow where the gradient is pointing. The same thing happens at location three, where the gradient is actually pointing equatorward. So the system starts moving in the eastward direction. And finally over here, the gradient points inward and the system starts going towards the equator. And that's precisely what you see over here, right? These waves, this is the gradient that you have. So at this region, the system is going this way, going this way, going this way, and then it curves around this guy and tries to come back. So the guidance of these waves is purely due to the kind of moist PV gradients you have. And one more thing to note is that the Kelvin wave has a high divergent component, whereas this long time response that we have got is actually rotational in character. So this is a rotational moist wave that has been created, which would be absent if there was no moisture in the problem, right? So this gives you an example where we can see that uh, the presence of moisture has actually given you a new wave, and we can understand this wave to some extent. Oh, this should be longer, not loner time. And we can extend and we can understand the propagation of that wave to some extent by using a basic principle like the conservation of moist PV. Right? So oh, let me see what time it is. Oh, okay, I'm pretty much out of time. So let me, uh, let me summarize this part. So the overall intent was to get a feel for tropical variability and try and see if we can expand upon the dry uh, linear shallow water equations uh, into a moist framework, which has been done by uh, quite a number of people. So we adopt those equations and we try to see whether the kind of waves that are generated by it have a coherent moisture and uh, other dynamical variables that we see in observation. So we saw that for the equatorial Rossby waves, we saw it for the Kelvin waves. We also, when you go to a case where 
the uh, background saturation by Vagala Lee, the function of latitude and longitude, you actually see a new kind of wave, which is rotational in character, right? So the moist problem spontaneously adjust to low frequency large scale waves. And these waves have characters that are very much in accord with the kind of observations that one has for convectively coupled waves, or at least in a qualitative way, one can't really make anything uh, more detailed based on these very simple models. But I think it's encouraging that it's able to catch these, uh, uh, these phenomena in a relatively uh, in, in a relatively nice uh, or a consistent manner. Right? So I will end this by putting this slide up over here. I promised money that there are a lot of open questions over here. And here's a list of stuff, which is a very, very long list of things that have been done and are not nearly anywhere near complete and can be expanded upon by using these kinds of system, uh, use these kinds of simple systems. And you can see that all the references are essentially from the past 10 years. So this is very active and ongoing work where people have looked at instabilities of these flows in the presence of moisture. How does barotropic instability change if you have moisture? How does baroclinic instability change if you make a two-layer version of this model? There are things like a moisture vortex instability that comes up, which is applicable for monsoon lows. What happens to the general geostrophic adjustment in the presence of these kinds of moist anomalies? Things of this kind over here, right? So I'll leave you with this. If you have any questions on this, I'll be happy to answer them. I think I'll stop over here and um, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sakatme. Uh, sure. We can take some questions. So you could type here in the chat box or unmute and directly ask. So yeah, I guess it's better to ask because I can't see the chat box. Over here. Yes, uh, Professor Verma, you can go ahead and ask. Yeah. yeah so hello, Jay. Nice talk. Uh, hi. Hi, Mahindra. Yeah. Hi. So. Is it that uh, this moisture, in fact, I was surprised that it is feeding energy at reasonably large scale because it is, uh, uh, I guess, yeah, so that's what you're telling. And is there some kind of inverse cascade that is leading to, inverse cascade of energy which is leading to uh, enhancement of energy at small, even smaller wave numbers? Right. So I, 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 I guess you're going to force me to show the turbulence slides. Let me go ahead and show you one picture. So this is the stuff that I skipped over. So if you actually do a simulation of these uh, of these systems where you force it at small scales, what you uh -huh. see is you actually do see an inverse transfer of energy with a uh, with pretty much a minus five third scaling over here, which is partitioned strongly into the rotational modes. Right. And more importantly, like you said, see here, once again, if you look at the wave number frequency diagram, the energy is coalescing into the lower frequency modes, right? These guys seem to have a very small amount of energy as things, uh, uh, as the energy goes upscale. But if you look at the waves, uh, you, uh, sorry, if you actually look at the moisture field and you compute the flux of the moisture field, you find that the moisture field also seems to show a very weak, but inverse transfer of, let's say, moisture variance. So this was something that we really didn't expect. That is uh, a field that's being advected by the flow, even though it's dynamically active in some sense, for it to exhibit a inverse transfer was something we really uh, were surprised by. But it is a very small inverse transfer, but clearly it seems to be building up towards larger scales when you force it at a uh, fairly small scale over here. I see. OK. Did you compute the flux? I mean, the way we did it. Exactly. So I think it's uh, it's borrowed from your code itself. This is what Joseph Scrotal uh, Scrotal coded up. I had given him your reference itself. So this is precisely the flux he showed. So you see a negative flux that's very weak. Oh, this is the flux is it? Oh, I thought it's okay. This is no. So this is uh, no. Flux. This is just the spectrum. I I, okay. I haven't plotted the flux here. So the flux is in the paper. You can uh, you can see that it's negative. I see, I, this I look at okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so well, well, one more thing, like 2D plays a big, big role in this, uh, is a shallow water, that's why. Right, right. So that is going to be the big thing, right? That, that you see, all of this is fine for the essentially quasi 2D shallow water flow. The planetary scale waves and so on are probably going to remain the way they are, but the robustness of this inverse transfer is something that will have to now be checked in the multiple layer model, whether, uh, whether it's a peculiarity just of the 2D nature or not. That's something that we'll have to look at. And probably that's going to encounter uh, problems because you're going to have a forward transfer due to your stratified system and so on. That's probably going to create an issue. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, there's a question in the chat box from Sharath 
uh, is there a threshold for the amplitude of the moisture anomaly introduced at t equals zero for this rotational mode to appear? Right, right. So, uh, so you don't need a threshold for the rotational mode. The way the the restriction comes from over here. So, where's let, let me go back to that slide. So, the equivalent depth, as I showed you, comes about from uh, this guy over here, right? So, it's a product of whatever you choose as this uh, thing that mimics the latent heat and the maximum value you have of QS. So, if I take my initial moisture anomaly to be comparable to QS, and if my Chi starts becoming too large, this is going to become negative over here, right? So that's the unstable case that you don't want to get into, which will sort of blow up, right? So you don't really need a threshold to generate the rotational mode. It comes about from, from pretty much any amplitude of anomaly you have, at least the ones we have tried out. But the constraint you have is the product of these two guys must be less than H. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, if there aren't any, then uh, let's thank uh, Professor Sukhatmi once again. Okay, there's one more question uh, I see. Uh, Abhishek is asking, is the frequency low because group velocity is small? Uh, well, um, I don't know if, uh, uh, so the group velocity uh, of these, these waves will become small, but I don't know if that's the reason why you will tend to see low frequencies, uh, low frequency signals. It's essentially after the adjustment process, uh, you're right that the energy that is present in the uh, system, in the waves that have a larger group velocity will essentially get dispersed away and uh, will get dissipated. So naturally what remains behind are the things that have a lower group velocity. So that's uh, that would be, I suppose, intuitive. And I think that, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I suppose there is a link there. So if there aren't any questions, uh, thank you, Professor Supatme, for this excellent talk. Thanks, sir. And we have around a 10-minute break, and we resume at 4.30 with the last two talks of this session, which would be by Professor uh, Pierre-Philippe Corte, the first speaker, and followed by Professor Samriddhi uh, Sankarre from ICTS. Okay, so how do I unshare from this? Uh, you can just end it. Uh, there should be a button on the left. Uh, okay, I probably easier if I just leave the meeting and join again. Uh, let's see, where is this guy? Yes, as long as you will join the meeting again, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I because uh, some of my multiple screens over here are causing a problem. Okay, let me shut this guy down. What happens? Yeah, it's so, gone now. Okay, I'm gone. Okay. Now I can say screen sharing has stopped. Yes. Oh, good. Oh, nice. Okay, Thanks. Yeah, I have some question yeah. if, you are, if you have time. Yeah, sure, go ahead. So uh, the energetics, I mean, you can compute the energetics, no? I mean, uh, how much moisture is being condensing? Uh, so does it match with the increase in, in, in the energy? Yeah, right. So, uh, so, what, so we haven't looked at the energy balance. Uh, we have looked at the uh, amount of in, uh, amount of stuff being condensed and amount being evaporated. So that basically reaches a uh, equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Right, so there is okay. no net stuff going in or coming out. But in terms okay. of the actual energy that is being fed into the system by buoyant conversion, and okay. the amount that is being fed in by the latent heating, if you add all of those up, the uh, I, we, we haven't checked the complete energy balance. I, uh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So one more. I mean, just curiosity. Uh, so supposedly moisture will increase with uh, climate warming. Uh, uh, sorry, global warming. Uh, so so these things will become even more and more energetic. No, I mean, that's uh, so. I guess that's a very difficult question to answer in some sense because I guess there are two two there's uh, there are multiple things that go on at the same time, right? One is that if you say that the temperature is increasing, uh, that's mm -hmm. uh, and that's fine because that's what we experience. Now, uh, by uh, by Clausius clap, uh, uh, Clapeyron, you can say that you can hold more water vapor in the at, uh, in the atmosphere. Now, uh, does this necessarily mean you will hold more water vapor in the atmosphere? 
uh, it observation seems to suggest yeah the specific humidity is going up but right. one of the things to note is that the limiting fact towards getting precipitation is that you have to have a balance between evaporation and precipitation in the global mean sense right and the evaporation is strongly limited by the humidity in the boundary layer and that is very difficult to change see even if you have more water vapor in the atmosphere the amount that is being evaporated in tends to be limited or the amount of precipitation that you can get tends to be limited by the limited evaporation that can occur so whether these systems will become more intense is something that i don't really know if there's a straightforward answer that one can do a simple cal uh, cal calculation to say that okay uh, so the, so a lot of guys have tried to see say for example if you study these uh, the the uh, the tropical cyclones and so on whether mm. due to global warming you will have more tropical cyclones or will you have more intense tropical cy uh, uh, cyclones or what will be the fate and i don't mm. really think as far as i know i mean somebody else might have a much better answer but as far as i know there's no clear cut answer on uh, what will be the outcome of these competing processes i see okay so uh, okay i guess we are running out of time but so we heard some we are our, in our turbulence seminar so there was quite interesting set of work by leon group uh, alexandre uh, so they they analyze the turbulence waves and structure separately ha huh. you are aware of this sir? no which group is this uh, this is leon group uh, alexandre dux i can send you the reference okay so okay, that would be good ha huh? so, so how did they do the decomposition so it's a lot of fourier transforms huh? and uh, huh. uh, so by the fourier transforms um, uh, they are able to kind of uh, uh, well i mean they, i don't fully understand the, the stuff Uh, so they look at omega versus k huh. and there are some places will will show like wave behavior huh. there will be deviation from the dispersion relation then they call it uh, 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 structure turbulence so anyway that is very useful so there I are the three things they claim that they are able to differentiate ha huh. i see interesting so i actually if you look at those wave number frequency diagrams that i showed you they also they, they have a background that's been removed so realistically there is actually a turbulent background there Right, right. So that so, uh, seems interesting, but it's huh. quite a well. I mean, I heard the talk only, and in fact, I was there in the thesis examination as well. But <laughs> anyway, you, you. But uh, look, I mean, I didn't follow the math fully. Uh, try say, I, I, I'll, I'll see. Send, uh, send me the reference. I'll see if I can. Uh, I'll send, uh, I'll send it. I'll send it. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. So. Okay. I see you. I have. A, I have another meeting then in the class. So I guess I should. Yeah, yeah, I was. I think it's what four thirty. I have a meeting at four forty-five. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Nice to see you. Me too. Yeah. Okay. So I will quit. Huh? Yeah. Thank Bye. you, Jay. Thanks.